if you look at the death rates of prisoners held by the British, there was less than 0.1% of the, our prisoners died. Americans are slightly more, around 0.1%. Um, prisoners who ended up in the, in the Soviet Union, 35% of them died. Hello. When war ended in Europe on the 8th of May 1945, much of the continent was in ruins. Cities had been destroyed and civilians were at the mercy of occupying armies. With no infrastructure or institutions, it was simply chaos. Keith Lowe joins to discuss what it was like from France to Poland via Germany and Greece as the Iron Curtain began to descend. Plenty more great history to come, including Hitler's people, the fall of the Ottoman Empire... 18th century Europe through the eyes of a princess and much much more so please do share 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 to help the pod grow thanks to those who've given a kind review but that's enough for me as I hand you over to Keith and myself on Europe after the war Keith, welcome back to the podcast. And it's been a while because you've been hard at work on a new book. But thank you for joining me. Good to be here. Good to see you again, as always, Ollie. Cool. OK, so now we're not actually. So your new book is coming out in a few months time. So I'm going to get you back on here. Um, but right. before we did that, I was really keen to talk to you about a book that you wrote a few years ago and which is actually our, our book club at the moment so it was in our latest issue of the magazine and uh, it'll be coming out this weekend uh, a Q&A with you which is Savage Continent and so Savage Continent Europe in the aftermath of World War Two, and actually it's quite it's quite timely for me at least and for listeners to talk to you about this because recently we had Richard Overy on or at least I had Richard Overy on to talk about He's written a new book called Why War. Okay. And Savage Continent is a very, the book is a very good answer as to why you shouldn't really have wars because <laughs> this <laughs> massive conflict, which is the most lethal war of, of, of all time, uh, your book really does capture the horrors of the immediate aftermath and the, and the, I guess the results of, of the war. And, uh, I want. I wanted to start by asking you, and I know it's a big subject. And actually, that's one of the interesting thing about your book is that it's one of the only books that really covers the Europe-wide problems after the war. But what was Europe like? Mainland Europe, like in you know, it was chaos, wasn't it? No, absolutely, absolutely. This what you were saying about um, you know Richard Avery and, and why war and and so on and wars are never a good thing. I, I mean, we we all know that wars aren't a good thing. But uh, what we forget is that it doesn't just end with, you know, the signing of a, a piece of paper at the end of the war. The chaos doesn't stop there. It carries on for weeks, months, years, in fact. And, and, and that's what happened after World War II across the whole of Europe. The, the, the continent was in absolute chaos. You know, all the institutions that, that, help, that normally hold things together, you know, police forces, governments, post offices, you name it, all the institutions have been completely wiped out by the war and they've got to be rebuilt again. And and in that period, while they, they haven't yet been rebuilt, there's just chaos. It's lawless. It's unbelievable some of the things that went on all across Europe in, in 1945 and 1946 and 47. Civil wars breaking out, revenge being taken. I mean, you name it. It was it was it was horrendous. So we in Britain and listeners in the US, which makes up a majority of the listenership, and then, of course, others in, in like Australia, would not have experienced this kind of chaos then. This is really, we're looking at, uh, I mean, France is probably the closest sort of Western country that experienced these problems. But is it, where are we really talking about? Well, we're talking, well, all, all of Europe, all of Europe. So, you know, in France, for example, France is the least sort of badly affected of the, they had a, I mean, it was, it was, it was brutal, the war there, but it was much less brutal. You know, the further east you go, the worse things get, basically. So, you know, even in France, though, 
you know, we we sort of liberate the the country by the end of September 1944. It's it's all liberated, but uh, you know, there's no police forces. All the police have been have been sort of implicated in being collaborators. So in lots of places, the the police have either made themselves scarce, or they've been rounded up by resistance people or people who call themselves a resistance, and and then thrown into their own prison cells. And sometimes they've been tortured. There's all kind of revenge which takes place. About 9,000 people are murdered for being collaborators during the course of the of the liberation and, and afterwards. So, you know, there's, there's lawlessness even in this place. But then when you go to Poland, I mean, the, the scale just goes it's so big. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are killed after the war is supposed to be over. I mean, it's there are whole populations which are are expelled from the country. Um, there are population exchanges, there are border changes, but everything that can possibly happen in Poland happens after the war. Is about, the violence is supposed to be over, but it, 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 it carries on. And so Poland then would have been under occupation by the Soviet forces. Yes. Were they allowing this to, the, if we use Poland as a good example here, do, do the Soviets, the Red Army, are they just sort of they've stood down and they're allowing this violence to continue well i mean partly they're allowing it partly they're encouraging it and um partly they they're responsible for it themselves you know the the you've got to remember it's difficult to define what poland is in 1945 because all the borders change but in may 1945 they haven't yet so you know what are we calling poland because a, a lot of East Germany becomes Poland after after Potsdam. Um, so the the sort of western parts of Poland, which were the eastern parts of Germany, are are really a lawless. It's like the Wild West. In fact, the Poles called it the Wild West at the time because uh, you know they're trying to kick out the German population and replace them with with Poles, and so they set up all these sort of concentration camps for Germans who were then treated really appallingly. I mean, it's it's not it's not as bad as Auschwitz or anything, but uh, it's still pretty appalling. Torture and all kinds of things going on. Thousands of people being killed. And there are no police forces. There are, are Polish people arriving. They've basically just got a stake. They claim that there's a house. I'll take that one. So they do. And then someone else wants to have it. So then they have a fight over it. Women in, uh, are raped in the streets. There's this one guy I interviewed. His name was Zbigniew Ogrodzinski, and he was uh, one of the first Polish officials to arrive in Stettin, as it was, Szczecin, as it's now called. And uh, he, he was responsible for sort of trying to create a like a local government there. But really, he's got no power whatsoever. The only people who've got any power are the Soviet soldiers. So he's just walking down the main street. He's got his hand on his gun everywhere he goes because he, you never know who's going to leap out at you. And he comes across a bunch of Soviet soldiers raping a German woman just there in the street. And he's sort of horrified, throws up his hands, runs around the corner and finds the NKVD station. There's a couple of officers there and he sort of shouts and there's a woman being raped. So they come round the corner, see their own soldiers raping this woman, stop it, take the two soldiers who is, and and just shoot them there against the wall, and then just go back to the go back to their station, leaving Zbigniew standing there like, what the hell's just happened? And this was an everyday occurrence, and th this was what must have been uh, July or August 1945. So the war's over, but this sort of thing is happening all around him every day. It's it's utter chaos. OK, so Poland then. How, how long does this go on for until, I guess, a, a government is imposed by the yeah. Soviets? Yeah, well, well, different parts are, I mean, the, the Soviets got control of the eastern parts of Poland relatively quickly. The western parts were all a bit more chaotic. Um, lots of expulsions going on. Nobody even really knows where they're going to be. Germans don't know whether they're staying or going. Um, but, you know, things are pretty chaotic in the in parts of the East as well, because um, there's this population exchange between the Ukrainians and the Poles, because parts of what used to be Poland now become part of Ukraine. 
So you, know, you, you now have lots of Poles living in what's become Ukraine, and there's lots of Ukrainians who are living in, in Poland. They, they, these, from the time of empires, the populations are all very mixed up, and now they want to sort things out. So they start expelling people left, right, and centre. So even in 1947, there are massacres going on, uh, massacres of uh, Ukrainians in Poland who are not wanted anymore. You've got Germans being expelled at the other end. There's a kind of civil war going on between Poles and Ukrainians. So that's not really sorted out until 1948, actually. So that's three years after the, the war's supposed to be finished. And then on top of that, you've got all the political violence as the communists are trying to assert their control and get rid of kulaks and middle class people and anybody with aristocratic blood they're they're all being persecuted so there's just so much going on it's 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 uh yeah layer upon layer of different kinds of violence happening you know? did you find that quite surprising when before i mean obviously you you wrote the book so you kind of knew you decided to write the book so you knew what it would be like but were the levels of violence a more, yeah, no, more I than was, you expected I, I was i was absolutely surprised i mean there, there are bits and bobs that i knew about uh you know the, the greek civil war went on till 1949 for example um uh and there were people in latvia and lithuania who were resisting the the soviet uh, all the way up into the 1950s um but there were there, there, there were just sort of little pockets i knew about when when i went to research this originally i was just going to write a book about germany but i thought you know, I'll do some background reading on what's going on around Germany. And the more I read, the more I'm like, oh, wow, actually, this is real. So I expanded it to the whole of Europe. And all the same chaos which is happening in Germany is also happening everywhere else. So I, I thought, actually, thematically, it's, it makes more sense to keep Europe as a single unit and, and show you know, the politics is the same here, or here, there and everywhere. The, the you know, communists versus nationalists and collaborators being punished and so on. There are civil wars breaking out everywhere. There's all kinds of things. There's revenge taking place everywhere. So I thought it made much more sense to, to cover the whole continent thematically rather than picking it country by country. It's uh, It really did surprise me. To get into it, the more surprising it is. I mean, it's, the stories are unbelievable. Well, the way you've separated out the sections of your books in sort of parts one, uh, well, they're sort of they're, they're epic titles, you know, legacy and um, and that kind of thing. It's just it, it does speak to what you're you're kind of describing. Um, so if we look at Germany, then what one assumes, okay, so this if this was the originally the idea behind the book, Germany in the aftermath, Charles Milton has spoken about Berlin in the aftermath. But the wider Germany presumably is split between the allies yeah. with, you know, with armies there to ensure there's no violence that does take place. But is is am I wrong in thinking that? Yeah, well, I mean, the armies are there. They are the only authority in Germany, really. Um, but, you know, armies are not they're they're made to fight wars. They They don't know about policing. That's not what they're trained to do. You know, it's, it's not just it's not just policing. It's also government. I mean, the allied military governments were they did their best. But, you know, that's not what the armies are set out to do. And and so they, they weren't actually very good at it. You've got to govern civil populations who who need water. They need policing. They need schools. All the schools have been bombed. So what do you do? They need accommodation. Who's going to build everything? These are things that armies aren't good at. And as we know, you know, Hamburg, Dresden, Nuremberg, to name yeah. just three, they've been, they, they don't exist anymore almost. Yeah, the devastation is, is like, I mean, here in Britain, we have a sort of idea of, of what the Blitz was like, you know, this sort of, you see destroyed streets or, or, you know, everybody grew up, I grew up with a, a bomb site across from where I lived in, the, even in the 1980s, it was where I used to play with, with the other kids amongst the rubble, you know, before they built something new. But that's just one one building, really. If you go to somewhere like Hamburg, it's like its entire neighbourhoods are just flat. It's just rubble as far as the eye can see. And underneath the rubble, there are still dead bodies that they're exhuming after the war in sort of 1946 and so on. So the, the scale of it, the scale of the destruction is is beyond anything that we in Britain really have any understanding of. 
Yeah. And so, okay, one thing that really interested me, and you cover it in the book as well, is German prisoners of war, particularly Germans captured by the Red Army and sent east. And one assumes that, you know, after Potsdam, after treaties are signed, then every uh, every army sends their prisoner of, prisoners of war back to their home country within, you know, a few months. And it's not really a prison sentence. But with German prisoners of war, they certainly are not sent back quickly, are they? No, no. Well, not even the British and Americans sent them back quickly. I mean, they were still we were still holding on to German prisoners of war in 1947, um, 1948 even. Controversially, uh, the the Brits used them to clear landmines, so because uh, they didn't want they didn't want any injuries amongst their own, so they made the Germans do it, and that when news of that came out um that that was sort of quickly stopped but uh you know our first instinct is to use the german prisoners of war to do the do the work uh but yeah the soviet the 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 germans who ended up being captured by the soviets had a much tougher time i mean if if you look at the death rates for example we we held uh, probably about three and a half million germans german prisoners of war were held by the british in in the summer of 1945 and another three million or and where, so. where were they keith they, they they were they were held in like big um camps uh, on along the rhine they had these huge camps that held like a hundred thousand people in in one place so you know conditions were pretty awful but we very quickly began releasing them because just just didn't have the facilities to hold on to them for very long the americans held on to them for a bit longer and were determined that we're going to try a lot of these people um so they tried to sort of work out you know sort the sheep from the goats and uh, and try the the officers and people who might have been responsible for war crimes and so on but eventually they too started letting them free earlier the soviets on the other hand they kept them in gulags up into the mid 1950s so if you look at the death rates of prisoners held by the british there was less than 0.1% of the our prisoners died. The Americans are slightly more, around 0.1%. Um, prisoners who ended up in the in the Soviet Union, 35% of them died. They never came home. So it just goes to show that the if you if you're a German soldier, you don't want to be caught by the Soviets. You want to be caught by the the, the Western Allies. And actually, at the very end of the war millions of germans were fight trying to fight their way back to the west to try and be caught by the by the west not by the east because they they knew what was coming yeah that's an absolutely extraordinary statistic do we know roughly how many uh, german soldiers were sent east were captured by the soviets uh, yeah around the, the same sort of number about 3 million ish right yeah oh it's absolutely um it's absolutely mad numbers you've mentioned this already in with one example but the experience of women and and children across the continent as well i mean the weaker i don't want to imply that you know women are the weaker sex but in this in this case women and children are very much going to be targeted by those who are armed and stronger and and this is a, a another horrifying result of the chaos yeah I mean, well, I mean, I I would hesitate to call the women the weaker sex because actually, no, no, I, that's what I meant. Yeah. Are, are, are really impressive, but the the children, absolutely, they're just, they're just children. They don't know what's going on, um, and they they have a really tough time in in the post war. There's a lot in the book actually about orphans and 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 kids who have got you know running around in the rubble with nobody looking after them, trying to survive. Then you've got all kinds of like kids who are kidnapped from their parents by the nazis and because they were blonde and had blue eyes and given to new parents who and they they've got to then be given back to their original parents at the end of the war but a lot of them don't even remember their original parents they speak german now they don't they don't speak polish um what do they want to go to these strangers for so that's really traumatic then you've got there were lots of german soldiers who had sex with local women and and then the women had children who were called you know german babies even though their their mothers might have been norwegian or whatever and they're not wanted anymore so there are you've got governments trying to expel children from the country 
you know, they, they lock up the mothers. They say the mothers, they slept with German soldiers. So there's of, they're obviously mentally deficient. So they put them in sort of homes for the mentally deficient and then took their children off them and treated them as if they were orphans and tried to get the ship them out to other countries, to Australia or, or, or wherever. I mean, it's it's really brutal. Some of the things that happen to the kids, definitely. This is not a cheery book. <laughs> yeah, don't read it before bedtime. Yeah, no, no. I mean, one area that really interests me is the Greek Civil War because during this much of the war, because the Greek Civil War almost breaks out before the end of the Second World War, or at least you get sort of early beginnings of it. And I, I was traveling in northern Greece, very northern Greece, um, right. close to what is now the former Macedonia and, and Albania. And there was this abandoned village that had been destroyed during the Greek Civil War. I think there was a lot of quite severe fighting up north as well. Yeah. And this is something that's really strange because you get British troops fighting in the streets against Greeks who a few months before they would have been fighting together yeah. against the Germans. Yeah. The Greek Civil War is just, I think, one of, of a few that resulted as post-war. But why did the Greek Civil War break out? Wow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are all kinds of answers to that question. I mean, the most effective partisans who were, you know, resisting the Germans were communists. So, you know, at the end of the war, we're, we're not really on good terms with communists so much anymore. Churchill never liked the Greek communist resistance anyway. So he was always very resistant to giving them any positions of power after Greece had been liberated. So in December 1944, there was a British guy who was in charge of Greece. I, I can't remember his name. It was Ronald Scobie or Scobie anyway was his surname. And, and he was sort of quite rabidly anti-communist. So you've got all these partisans who've been fighting for their country and, and suddenly they're being sidelined. And the people who are being put in charge are the former collaborators. So there's a lot of anger about that. And uh, fighting breaks out. The British who are in control take the side of the collaborators and start, you know, like you say, fighting against the partisans. They even send spitfires in to strafe them and, and so on. I mean, it's quite sort of uh, dramatic. Um, and that just sort of escalates over time. Um, then you get in the reason why your village in the north is is deserted is because uh, the north is where it ends up being the the center of where the the communists are because they've got a border with Yugoslavia. So Tito is helping them out, sending weapons and so on. So there's all that going on. But then underneath it all, there's all the kinds of like local feuds between people. I, I'll tell a story in the book about um, this local little village where. You know, the the local feud begins when there's one guy falls in love with a woman who spurns him. So when during the occupation, he tells the Italians that uh, she, she's she's hiding weapons just because he's pissed off with her, really. And so the Italians go and they beat her up. They don't find any weapons, but they sort of they, they mark her out. And so she's now resentful of him. So she ends up joining the resistance. He ends up being sort of a kind of a collaborator. The communists come and they try and bump him off. And and so, you know, you end up with this, the, the whole village becomes split between these people who are supposedly collaborators and these other people who are supposedly, you know, communists. But actually, it's all come from this little feud between these two families. It's got nothing to do with communism and, and collaboration at all. So it's, re it's really complicated, these things. You can never quite pin down exactly... What's the cause? It's interesting, Greece. How close did Greece actually come to being communist? Because, I mean, they still get about, I think, 8 to 10% in the vote in, in elections today. They, they were never close to being communist. There's no way that the, the British were going to allow that. And and actually, when Britain started running out of money, it was it was Greece and Turkey that were the... You know, the the possibility of of communists taking over there that drew the Americans into, um, you know the 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 Truman Doctrine 
and the Marshall Plan and so on. That, that was all born out of the situation in Greece and, and the British saying, look, we can't handle this anymore. There's no way the Western powers were going to allow that to happen, even if that meant collaborating with former Nazis. You know, and Stalin and, and Churchill had almost done a deal to allow... Yeah, to keep yeah. Greece within the West, and um, yeah, the, the the famous uh, sort of back of the envelope agreement that um, Churchill made with Stalin that uh, that um, that Greece would be under the British sphere of influence, and and then he would leave Poland and Bulgaria and so on to the to the um, to the Stalin and his his lot. Well, another big population move during this period is obviously you know Jews who have suffered so horrifically during the Holocaust. And so presumably they are released from camps. And what were the kind of steps to, I guess, ultimately end up in, in Israel for those who wanted to go to Israel? Because they weren't welcome back into the places where they had been um, removed. No, they? well, that's the thing. A, a, a lot of people, uh, well, those who were in hiding or who, who, you know, went east during the war and managed to escape the, the, the Holocaust often came back to places like Poland. Um, then there were people who came out of the concentration camps who'd survived, wanted to go back to their homes. But, you know, they, they go back to their villages and, and there's nobody there. They've all they've all they've all been killed. So, you know, do you really want to live in this sort of ghost town? Then there were others who who went back to their you know apartments or whatever in cities and found that they, you know, while they're away, someone else has moved in and, and they don't want to move out. They, they consider it their property now. So you end up with these sort of local feuds over who owns the who owns the apartment. Uh, you know, where's all my furniture gone? Well, it's with the neighbours. And if you go round to the neighbours to try and get it back, the neighbour, you know, w- wants to fight you off. So there's a lot of resentment towards returning Jews. And, and in some places you, you end up with pogroms breaking out again, especially in Hungary and, and um, Slovakia and Poland. The famous one was the Kielce pogrom, where hundred people were killed. I think, um, and you know, Jews begin to realise they're not welcome anymore. So, in nineteen forty-six, uh, three hundred thousand Jews flee Eastern Europe and try to make their way to other countries. Some of them come to Britain, some to America, but most of them want to go to Palestine, as it was then. But yeah, they, they, there's a whole uh, sort of Jewish underground movement to get them in by, by hook or by crook. Sort of people smugglers, you'd call them nowadays. But yeah, they were trying to get people into to Israel under the British mandate. Because Britain and, uh, and America didn't really experience any, anything like this kind of chaos, how long did it take them, therefore? Uh, w- was it the Marshall Plan that really kind of allowed various states to to become functioning added to the Soviet, ultimately the iron curtain descending. Yeah. That, that settled everything down. Um, well, part, I mean, the, the most important thing is to get control. And the Soviets did that just as the, the British and Americans did got quite brutally. Really, You just got to get control because, um, you know, people killing each other on the streets is no good for anybody. And um, so, uh, yeah, so they they're quite brutal about it in some places, and and they. But once you've got control, um, you've got to give people some sort of hope that that they can carry, you know, that they can rebuild society. And Europe was really languishing. All of Europe was languishing um, for the first couple of years after the war. Um, you know, it was impossible to get anything built. It was it was really difficult to get people even fed. I mean, all the way through 1946, people in France were were trying to live on rations of only about a thousand calories a day, um, and th- and they got the rest from wherever they could—the black market, uh, and they were selling their family jewels or whatever it was they needed to do, selling their bodies in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. Prostitution everywhere in Europe, and the customers are mostly Allied soldiers. So you know, this isn't really an atmosphere of much hope for anybody. Even in Britain, austerity Britain, 1946, there's not a lot of hope around. People are pretty miserable. And But the one country that does have the resources to sort this out is the USA. You know, th- at the end of the war, they accounted for 50% of the entire world's GDP. 
So imagine that. They're, they're the only country who has money. And Europe really needs their help in order to, to get some kind of hope. And the Marshall Plan gave them that hope. It, it, that was the injection of not only cash, which was needed everywhere, but also a plan, you know, a, a, an idea that we can get out of this. And the economic miracle is, is born of both the money that was bring and, and the new hope that came with it. And was that, uh, how did that go down in America? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think people, there, there were sort of two sides of the story. There were the humanitarians who thought, you know, we've got to do something to, to help Europe. So there were, I mean, there was all the way through the, this time, there was vast amounts of aid coming through sort of Christian uh, organizations and Jewish organizations being sent over. So there was lots of aid anyway. So you've got that group of Americans. But then, then there's the other side who don't really care so much about the humanitarian aspect, but they are afraid of communism. And so they're going to do anything to stop the communists taking over. And, and if that means giving loads of money to Europe, then so be it. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. So there's two sides of the coin which are both working together to make, you know, to, to bring support for this new policy. Well, we're getting to the end. We're running out, out of time. But there is a uh, there is a section where you write about Yugoslavia in the book. And there is an argument that the civil war that then broke out in the in the 90s um, was we had the death of, of Marshal Tito, I think, in the mid 80s. And yeah. then within a few years, you have a civil war in Yugoslavia. So there is an argument that Tito sort of his uh, very effective rule delays delays a civil war in Yugoslavia after the war until the 90s yeah what would you what would you say about that uh well yeah I mean it's like I said um the most important thing is to bring control and Tito was unbelievably brutal about establishing control in 45 and 46 I mean he he rounded up all the collaborators or all, all the most um sort of the people who were likely to oppose him and they were massacred. I mean, 60, 70,000 people put up in, uh, in front of trenches and shot in the back of the head. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty brutal. Actually, I went to, I went to a mass grave there and saw some of these bodies myself, people who, these were um, Ustasha officers who had been taken to a local mine in Slovenia and, uh, and thrown down the mine shafts basically. And then they they were bricked up to hide the evidence. It only came to light in the um, about sort of 10, 10 years ago. They finally exhumed all these bodies. Anyway, so it was really brutal. And, and it did establish control. And as long as you've got your charismatic leader in charge, that control stays. This is the problem with charismatic leaders. They, they don't last forever. Uh, and once he was gone... Well, there wasn't anybody of similar sort of authority to keep a lid on everything. And so you got all these sort of nationalist tensions coming up to the surface again. And w when the the war in the 90s broke out, there were they were started singing World War Two songs as they were going in to do these these new massacres. It was like a, you know, it was like sort of a skeleton rising up from the closet and 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 causing people to do all these unspeakable things all over again so absolutely there, there were the echoes were really stark at the time well Keith your book did really really well so this is my last question if you were to get another edition now and you know your publisher called you up and said look you know we want to do a new edition is there anything you would you would change to it or or is it perfect as it is uh, <laughs> I mean there's always there's always one or two corrections that, uh, as time goes on you you realize that there are, oh, oh I got that slightly wrong so yeah there there are a few things like that that I I might um uh tweak but the the recent events in Ukraine I mean there's so much there which is related to both the civil war which took place between Poles and Ukrainians the, the holocaust you know, Putin is always bringing up the Holocaust and saying that all Ukrainians are, are Nazis. And then there's the the whole reason for the war between Russia and Ukraine is is built in these borders that were were created in in 1945. So, yeah, I, I'd like to bring a lot more of that, the present day stuff into the book.
show how the echoes are still with us today. Interesting. Brilliant. Okay, Keith, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much. And um, listeners, links are in the show notes. Lovely to talk to you, Ollie. Thanks so much for listening. Plenty more history to come. So if you can leave a nice review and share with friends, that would be marvellous. But until then, thank you and good night. <laughs>